Okay, hello everybody. Um, I've escaped Bournemouth University and come out to Hillcrest this afternoon. It's the base of the Bournemouth Community Team for People um, with Learning Disability. And I'm here with Carrie Clark, who is one of the team leaders um, for LD in the service, and Becca Martin, who's a specialist physiotherapist working with people with learning disability. We're here to chat about learning disability and what it is and how physiotherapists are involved in their treatment and management of these people. Um, this is a resource for students who are, learned, who are preparing to go on placement and for anybody else that wants to learn a little bit more about people that might have a learning disability. So um, I'm going to ask Carrie and Becca to introduce themselves to you to begin with and just say a little bit more about what their role is. Okay. Yeah, so I'm Becca, Physio from the East Dorset team. Um, we work as a multidisciplinary team. We've got physios, OTs, and nurses, social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, and speech and language therapists. Is that everything? <laughs> uh, within our team. So we work jointly with them and meet regularly to discuss our patients. Um, Physio-wise, we'll look at all sorts of physio areas, so particularly MSK and neuro and cardiovascular, but it will be any, any physio problem that um, someone with a learning disability has. So we will look at um, trying to support them through mainstream physio, so if they're going to an outpatient appointment or if they've gone into hospital, we'll support with that side of things so they may struggle to understand the instructions that the physio is giving and we might be able to help that side of things um, and then support them when they come out into the community with exercises and things at home um, but we'll also look at specific um, problems related to their learning disability um, in particular posture management side of things so looking at sleep systems and seating and wheelchairs um, we'll also look at um, stretches and things that support staff might be able to help them with, um, hydrotherapy plans, um, health promotion, um, all sorts of things. Anything else? I've got to think of anything you've got to it's just a real range of everything. So like yeah. you say, it's any adult with a learning disability and a physio need. Yeah. It doesn't matter what their physio need is, it will support them mm -hmm. in any environment. So that sounds a very broad sort of um, job to have. It sounds quite quite diverse, quite varied. Yeah, so it's bringing all these skills from all the different areas yeah. into, into one and being a bit more creative as well to come up with fun and interesting ways to engage with, with people. I think that's the key, is that everything we do is completely person-centred because mm -hmm. if we just do off-the-mill exercises and different things that people find it, our clients particularly find it boring, they're not going to engage, they're not going to do it, so it's trying to make it completely person-centred, find out what interested to know what um, a learning disability is. It's quite, um, that's quite a complex term, isn't it? And I'd like to understand a little bit more about that. So can you explain that to me? Yeah, definitely. Well, as I mentioned, that our team will work with any adult with a learning disability. Um, we have psychologists in the team and they can often help diagnose a learning disability. So just because someone doesn't have a formal diagnosis doesn't mean they can't get support from our team. That's how we work. Um, as I mentioned, psychologists are often the ones in our team that end up helping with this diagnosis. Um, there's a Valuing People white paper that the Department of Health released in 2001 that kind of sums it up quite well. It splits it into three main categories. That a learning disability has to be is a condition that starts before adulthood, so the, before the age of 18, and has a long-lasting effect. That the person with a learning disability isn't going to suddenly have, not have a learning disability one day. Um, the, the person with a learning disability has a significantly reduced ability to understand new or complex information or to learn new skills. It's often kind of summarised as having impaired intelligence um, and a reduced ability to cope independently, so impaired social functioning. Um, to explain that a little bit more, the impaired intelligence side, that's where our psychologists come in and look at doing IQ testing. So the average IQ for the general population is 100. Anyone who scores 70 or below is diagnosed with a learning disability. They're seen as having a significant impairment. Um, the lower the IQ score, the more severe the learning disability. So you might have heard of terms like mild, moderate, severe, profound, or even profound and multiple learning disability. That's based, generally speaking, on the IQ score, but there is a link with social functioning as well. Um, so a person with impaired intelligence 
maybe slower to understand information or pick up new skills and they might struggle with specific tasks. Um, impaired social functioning um, means that the individual's capacity to cope with every acti sorry, everyday activities and life in general is impaired. Um, so a person with impaired social functioning might need extra support to be able to live independently and to cope with everyday activities. Um, the level of help that they require will depend on the person's specific and individual needs and that again is where the rest of our team come into it to look at what areas they can manage well, what areas they might need a bit more support with. Um, someone with a learning disability is likely to have additional communication needs that can make coping with some situations difficult and stressful as well. So we've, that's where speech and language therapy come in and our OTs are brilliant at doing functional assessments. So it's a real team effort um, with the diagnosis side. Um, in practice, most learning disabilities are either present at birth or have an onset in early childhood. Um, although we do have some clients that might be acquired brain injury, but it happens early on in childhood, and then again the effect of that is the same as someone with a learning disability, so they come under our team as having a learning disability. Um, the disability is permanent, it's a lifelong condition, um, and while a great deal can be done to improve the social functioning side, support people, promote skills, develop independence, the underlying impairment has a lasting effect on development, and so there isn't any cure or periods of non-disability. Okay, that's really <laughs> helpful. Thank you very much for explaining that. Um, so presumably that's quite a complex assessment from a psychologist to, to come up with that diagnosis. Would that take a period of time? It can do, but what we try to do as a team is to make sure that it doesn't affect the access um, to our team, the support okay. that someone gets. So what usually happens if we get a referral for someone um, specifically just asking for IQ assessment, fantastic, our psychologist, they've got a screening questionnaire, they'll send back out to the referrer that ask questions like, um, which school did the person go to, did they have any um, additional needs at, at school or any extra support that they required, did they manage to get any qualifications at the end of school, and general life questions about communication, how are they coping, what support do family give them at home, those sorts of things. Um, and then when they've got that, they've got specific tests and IQ assessments they can do at the same time, our OTs can look at the social functioning. Um, but if we got a referral for someone who need, needed urgent help, so needed physio, we wouldn't necessarily wait and say, oh no, wait for the IQ. We would get involved and start helping. And then if the IQ assessment came back that actually they didn't have a learning disability, we would then support with liaising with other services so that the person gets the right support they need and the most appropriate support. Referring on to the right, to the, uh, a different team, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. And you said that um, there's a variety of reasons and a variety of stages of onset, but most of it would be in the early years. Can yeah. you give us some examples of maybe some other reasons? Yeah, definitely. So we could have, there's various conditions that are genetic, so they happen before someone's born, like Down syndrome. It's often linked with having a learning disability, and it's due to the genetics before someone's born. Also complications during birth can result in a learning disability, so um, a loss of oxygen supply can lead to cerebral palsy, but also with a learning disability. You don't have to have a learning disability if you've got cerebral palsy, but often the two are linked, or you will kind of come together. Um, or in some cases you might have conditions like Rett syndrome, which again, although it's genetic, the child will have completely normal development until age, I think it's about two or three, when suddenly the developmental milestones start going backwards. So although the parents have absolutely no reason for concern until it's, the child's older, suddenly things start changing. Or similarly, if you've got a child who has met all the developmental milestones, but then when they start, they join school, they realise actually that things, their peers are overtaking them and the gaps are getting bigger. That's often when assessments might start. Um, but we do have adults that come to, up to our services and have, have been referred to us and haven't been detected sooner, so yeah, the mixture. So things can be picked up later, later in life, they're yeah. not always picked up under no. 18 and in those early years. No. And um, you've, you've probably already answered this, but just to clarify for the students and anybody else listening to this tape, because you've mentioned that some, sometimes it could be confused with things like acquired brain injury or cerebral palsy without, mm. the, um, with, without the learning disability, mm. so what is if we, we've said what a learning disability is, but how would you define what it isn't so that, we're not the, so that we understand the parameters of what this team and your yeah, unit is? Definitely. Um, the, there's a foundation for people with learning disabilities and they've got a brilliant website, so do have a look at it because they explain quite clearly what, what a learning disability isn't. Um, so a person with a specific learning difficulty might be described as having a specific problem processing certain forms of information. 
and learning difficulty doesn't affect your general intelligence or your IQ. Um, and an individual may often have more than one specific learning difficulty. So, for example, you might have dyslexia and dyspraxia, and the two together, or there might be others that are often encountered together, but they're very specific conditions that, that affect something, very specific processing of information. Um, so, uh, another example is um, ADHD, mm -hmm. that it, it affects a very specific area, but because it doesn't affect your general intelligence, your social functioning on, on a, gen a general level, it doesn't count as a learning disability, but what you will find in different places, different teams, sometimes people will say, oh, this person's got a living, learning difficulty, what they really mean is a learning disability, and vice versa. So whenever we get a referral, it's always worth screening. If we get some, a referral for someone with a learning difficulty, we'll send the screening referral back just to check do they actually have a learning disability, in which case that's fine, we can pick them up. If not, then we can re-refer and signpost to other places. Great. That's um, I understand a little bit more about what a learning disability is now. Um, so when I'm teaching the students, I'm always talking to them about gaining consent, and my big thing is ongoing consent and how we do that. Um, I work with people that have got brain injury, so you know, ongoing consent is, is really quite important. But it sounds like gaining consent from some of your clients could be quite a complex process. So can you tell us more, more about that? Mm. Yeah, so our team will spend quite a lot of time looking at whether the person has the capacity to make decisions. Um, and when looking at their mental capacity, we can't give a blanket term of this person does or doesn't have capacity. Um, you have to look at making it sort of time and decision specific. So it might be that someone is able to say they want a tea rather than a coffee or a blue jumper, not a yellow jumper, but actually they're not able to make a decision about whether they have from surgery or not, or um, a flu jab or not, um, because they're not able to weigh up the uh, pros and cons, which we'll go on to. Um, so it has to be specifically looking at what your decision you're working on um, each time. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of like context specific, yeah. context yeah. and time specific. Time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was the other thing we haven't said, is because obviously with someone with a learning disability, if they can't make the decision at one point because of their learning disability, as I mentioned before, it doesn't change, so they're not going to suddenly get capacity later on. Um, other conditions, like you mentioned, like brain injury, obviously, that's, you've got to take that into context, but there's also conditions like dementia, where one day someone might be in a, a window of lucidity and be able to make that decision and fully understand and, and all the points we'll go into in a minute, whereas the next day they might not. So yeah. it's got to be time and decision specific in yeah. that moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. We use the main five principles from the Mental Capacity Act, um, which is first of all assuming that every person can, has capacity and can make their own decisions unless you can prove that they can't. Something we often find, especially in, in hospital services, when it's presumed that they haven't got capacity, that goes against the Mental Capacity Act. You've got to presume that they have got capacity and prove that they don't. Um, a person must be given all practical help to um, be able to make their own decisions. So that comes down to giving them time to understand, time to process, time to ask questions, as well as in terms of the communication needs, making sure they've been given the right level of information in the right way. So for a lot of our clients, if they need surgery, we'll go through with pictures, easy read resources, take them around the hospital so they can meet the, the ward staff and understand the process by going through it as much as possible, um, just to maximise that capacity to be able to make their decision. Um, the third point is people have a right to make unwise decisions. We do it every day when I go for that third slice of cake. <laughs> I know that all the reasons it's bad for me, but when I want that cake, I'm going to take it anyway, and it goes against everyone's advice. It can be hard when you've got families who are very protective and care a lot for their, their loved ones, and they're thought to be taking really risky decisions, really unwise decisions that goes against everyone's advice and everyone else can see it's going to end in tears. That person wants to make that decision. If they've got capacity, they should be allowed to make that decision the same as anyone else. Um, the fourth point, if anything it is done on behalf of a person who lacks um, capacity, then it must be done in their best interest. We'll, we'll explain a little bit later on about the best interest process. And the last point, that someone making a decision or acting on behalf of a person who lacks capacity must consider whether the choice is the least restrictive option. Um, so that again, we'll cover this under the best interest section. Okay. 
Should we go straight on to the best interest and talk about that? I, mean, I think that's really clear what you've explained, and it's nice understanding that five, um, those five points. Um, and I think it's actually really helpful to understand that we all make bad decisions. That's, that's a really helpful example of three pieces of, of cake, because um, I'm, I'm guilty of that too. So we all like our cake, don't we? So yeah, I think that's, that's, that's really helpful. So um, yeah, so we're going to talk about best interests. Yeah. yeah, so just before that, it's, it's whether you're deciding whether you need to do a best interest decision or not, you need to assess whether that person has capacity. So you talked about the main principles of it, but to be able to decide whether someone has capacity in that moment to make that specific decision, you've got to answer two questions. Um, the first question is, is there an impairment or disturbance in the functioning of a person's mind or brain? And if so, then you go to stage two, which is the impairment or disturbance sufficient that the person lacks capacity to make a particular decision. Um, so in terms of stage one question, is there an impairment or disturbance in the functioning of the mind or brain? If that person has a learning disability, then yes. We've already talked about the, the social functioning, the, the IQ. Um, it means that there is something going on, which means that you go on to question two, which, do they lack capacity? That one's a bit more tricky, so I'll hand over to Becca yeah. to explain more about that. Um, so in terms of trying to work out whether they've got the capacity, there's four main areas that we need to look at. So the first one is, can they understand the information that's been given to them? So that's where you need to have ensured you've given the information in the best way for them. Um, so can they understand it in the first place? Are they able to re retain that information so they can hold that information long enough that they can make that decision. Can they weigh up the um, information available? So can they consider the pros and cons of the decision they're making? And are they able to communicate that decision back to you? Um, so this might be that they may be able to verbalise it, they might use sign language, um, blinking, whatever way they communicate. Um, but each of those stages, um, they need to have um, had an opportunity to understand, retain, way up and communicate to ensure they've got capacity. Sometimes we've used kind of creative ways to check someone's understanding. Um, for example, having a set of pictures that one side, if you put them in the right order, would tell the story of, if I make this decision, this is what happens, this is the consequence, this is the result. And then on the other side, if I make this decision, this happens, this, and you start through the pile of pictures and then the client is able to separate them out because that shows they have understanding that these are the two decisions, or multiple, and these are the consequences of making those decisions. Um, that's a really easy way to show understanding mm -hmm. without needing a huge amount of verbal mm -hmm. skill. Because sometimes we'll have some patients who just say yes, no, depending on what they think you want to hear. Or always pick the last option of a yeah, list. Yeah, or what they've just remembered. Yeah. But, um, so we actually have to explore, do they understand it? Do they know the consequences? Um, and, and weigh up whether they're making that decision. Yeah, I like the idea of the pictures and the order, because mm -hmm. that, that, that shows something more of just what the picture is, but also the context and, and yeah. the process, doesn't yeah. it? Which gives some indication of, of that level of understanding. Mm -hmm. So that's a really nice example. example. Think of is that when we had a gentleman with, who needed cataract surgery, um, and it was trying to weigh up, he, he had capacity, but we were trying to maximise his understanding. So with the pictures, it was, if I don't have the surgery, my cataracts will get worse, I won't be able to see, and then these might be the consequences of him not being able to see. Um, and then on the other side, and actually he weighed up the two options and, and made his choice very clearly. He didn't want the surgery, I think, in that case, and so we didn't go down that route, but he knew what the, the options were because the other side of things was that he would need the surgery and would have to go to the hospital. But we had done everything we could to take him through the hospital, introduce him, go through the processes so he understood that. Um, and that was the decision he made. So for that example, because again that's a really lovely example, how long did that take? Was that a couple of weeks? That was a long time. Yeah, <laughs> it was a long time. So he had the clinic appointment, so mm -hmm. where the doctor was saying, this is the operation we think you need, but then that was fed back to us mm -hmm. um, and us as a team worked with his support staff mm -hmm. who knew him really well yeah. to try and work out the best way to explore how we could check that he was making an informed decision. Mm -hmm. So and then we made some pictures and then we went and tried it with him. Um, so yeah, a matter of 
quite a few weeks, maybe yeah. a couple of months. With a lot of people involved, drawing on the, the team and the people who are involved and know him best anyway. Mm, really interesting. And I suppose um, a physio, an example of a physio intervention, like having a splint or maybe having some surgery for a tendon release mm. or even just surgery for anything, for anything medical, would be the same sort of process yeah. and quite a long process with that information, with pictures and understanding the pros and cons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and often yeah. a physio yeah. will be quite involved because we will perhaps when we've worked in another area, they also be dicks, we'll know what the surgery entails, what the rehab um, mm. happens afterwards mm. and be able to explain to the patient, mm. this is what you'll go through, this is what will happen mm. and, and the after, mm. um, so that they can understand the whole process mm. to make their decision. Yeah. So we're often the key member in particularly surgery, yeah. being involved. Mm. Great, that's some lovely examples, thank you. Um, and then the best interest. Yeah, so the if, best interest. if having done the mental capacity assessment, we've decided they didn't meet one of those um, m moments, the, they weren't able to make the decision themselves, we would have to look at making the decision for them. Um, but we would do that as a best, best interest decision involving as many health professionals who are in, involved, looking at family opinions, carers, anyone that's knows the person well um, and also what their wishes perhaps would be mm -hmm. um, so we would meet and um, look at the decision look at the options and weigh that up um, as a group um, to make that decision for them and um, looking at it being the least restrictive um, mm -hmm. and the best mm -hmm. decision that we feel we can make for them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm in line with the client wishes as well so mm -hmm. if we know that a client gets distressed by using their sleep system there's no way that's going to be in their best interest <laughs> so it's kind of it's mm -hmm. weighing up the, the pros and cons that kind of from a physio point of view we often come in with this ideal this is the program we'd like mm -hmm. to put in place but then it's talking through the family and the carers and the people that know the person best to say what is going to work, what will this person tolerate? If they're not going to tolerate it, it's not in their best interest um, or if there's a lesser restrictive option. So we often get asked as adult physios um, about using standing frames. And that's a piece of equipment that often people are, are kind of strapped in with Velcro straps and the idea is that someone will be able to stand up, be support, fully supported in a symmetrical position. Brilliant for range of movement, brilliant for weight bearing, breathing, circulation, lots of different things. But it is very restrictive. So in adult services, because we have to go through this process, it's looking at what the other options are. Could someone use a pacer instead where they're fully supported but they're mobile and then it's less restrictive because they can choose where to go. Yeah. Um, as passive stretching an option, would they tolerate that? Mm -hmm. um, will it have the same benefits to mm -hmm. the same effect? Um, or wearing gaiters or splints and mm -hmm. things that could be used for a specific time of day but don't restrict all the range of movement mm -hmm. at once. It's just all of those things that some people it's right, other people it's not. Mm -hmm. So it's just getting everyone together in the room talking about the different options and coming up with the best plan for the client involved. And I guess that comes back to the point you made earlier about us as physios thinking creatively, thinking outside the box. Mm -hmm. The goal might be to get somebody standing, weight bearing, stretching, but there's many ways of doing that yeah. and it's thinking yeah. about that within the best interest so that it's not painful, so that it's not distressing mm -hmm. and all the things that you've mentioned. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, great. Shall we done that? Was it? Yeah. yeah. Lovely. <laughs> about um, mental capacity and best interests and how that affects decision making around treatments um, and decisions to have treatment or not have treatment. Um, so I guess the next question is, is around the health needs of, of your clients and people that have a learning disability because um, obviously we've all got health needs, we all need to eat our five a day and not eat too much cake and do our exercise according to the guidance that we have. So how do you how do you manage the health needs of a person with a learning disability? Um, well yeah, as Becca mentioned before, that our team has lots of different professionals involved. Um, and we will support people to attend GP appointments and things like the annual health check. Um, which every person with a learning disability should be having every year with their GP. It's like an MOT, they'll run through everything. Um, and the reason for that is because there's certain conditions that are known to be higher or more prevalent in the learning disability population. Um, things like epilepsy, because you've got conditions like cerebral palsy and other um, incidents that happen during birth, which will increase that. Um, hypertension, obesity, thyroid problems, which is often linked with people with Down syndrome, there's a higher, higher incidence. Diabetes, poor dental hygiene, poor sight, 
hearing problems, heart problems, cerebral palsy already mentioned, but also gastrointestinal problems, like reflux and things like that, um, dysphagia, autism and Asperger's syndrome. So there's certain conditions that we know are higher anyway, either because of their other comorbidities and other diagnoses going on, or also because of health inequalities. If you've got someone who has poorer independent living skills, um, then they're going to have a, a poorer um, healthy lifestyle choices, which means they're going to have a worse diet, which increases the chance of diabetes and obesity and everything else, and it just spirals. Um, there's been a couple of reports over um, yeah, recent years. So MenCap wrote a report called Death by Indifference in 2007. Um, it focused on six people with a learning disability who all died, who shouldn't have died. Um, it, it's brilliant. The report goes into a lot of detail about the mistakes that were made all the way through, but the main points were um, kind of uh, poor access to healthcare when carers did take them, that symptoms weren't addressed quickly or seriously, they were downplayed by the GP because the client couldn't verbally report where the pain was or what was happening, but the carer knew something wasn't right, um, that it kind of delayed access to healthcare until the symptoms got worse. Um, then when clients were admitted, presumptions were made about the capacity so they weren't included in decisions or decisions were made without involving them or their carers who knew them best, um, either to prevent treatment, to say, oh, that treatment won't work for whatever reason they presumed, um, or to say, well, we'll have to go to this drastic treatment that, that wouldn't have been offered to someone who had capacity and was able to say, no, I, I want the other option. So it's just making sure that processes are followed, like we mentioned before, about best interest decisions involving everyone, just sitting down around the table and talking about the different options, um, can make such a significant difference as in this report, which led to the client's death. Um, the other report is the confidential inquiry into premature deaths of people with learning disabilities. Um, it was a study conducted in the southwest of England that looked into uh, 247 people um, uh, with LD who had died and looked at things like the, the reason they died, the main causes, um, what else could have been done um, to prevent it. Um, the report found that the most common problem why people got ill and died was because of heart problems and the most common reason for people eventually dying was because of chest infections. This is really different to the general population. Um, these are all things that actually physio-wise, heart problems, chest infections, we can get involved with and we can make a difference with. Um, so in terms of us being part of the LD team, it's really crucial. But as you can see with all the other things, epilepsy, diabetes, healthy lifestyle choices, it's so important that everyone is involved. Um, yeah. That's quite staggering, isn't it, those mm -hmm. two reports? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is, is, is quite staggering statistics, but also, I guess the thing that strikes me as you were, you were saying that is the role that we have as physios yeah. and the impact that we can make in terms of um, preventing some of those things mm. with exercise possibly and lifestyle Definitely. choices. As well as the way that, especially with our clients, we get to know them so well, we mm. know how, how they express pain. Mm. It might not be by saying ow like the rest of us, it might be through biting their hand or hitting their head more, more challenging behaviour, mm. lashing out. And that stops, so they call it diagnostic overshadowing, when um, doctors and GPs might make a diagnosis or miss the, a diagnosis and presume mm. it's something else related to their learning disability. Mm. But really what they're saying is, I'm in pain. Mm. Um, we've worked with so many people who've had OA joints, hips, knees, mm. and actually their challenging behaviour has been changed as soon as they started on the right pain medication, they've got mm. access to the right injections, or even gone in for the surgery, mm. where a lot of hospitals or other departments might have said, oh no, they'll never comply with the contraindications post surgery but actually with a bit of careful thought and planning and getting mm. everyone involved it can be possible and it makes a huge difference mm. afterwards. So I guess some of the secondary complications are those behavioural problems yeah. that can be treated again and like in brain injury we see that yeah. a lot where people can't express that they're in pain but they're given adequate pain the, and then the their behaviour mm. is different and then they can adhere to therapy and then their pain might get better because yeah. they're moving more yeah. so it's that same cycle because it's not mm. when they're not in pain every mm. time you come to visit and mm. things like that it, yeah mm. it makes a big difference okay mm. good so then you, uh, we're moving on to uh, reasonable adjustments? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so in terms of someone with a learning disability accessing healthcare, um, 
particularly going into hospital can be a difficult time. It's a very strange environment, different people. Can, some of the treatments can be quite scary if you don't understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, we would always try and get uh, someone to attend mainstream services, um, but we might support them with that. And we would expect there to be reasonable adjustments made to make that a smoother process for them. Um, so there is a document um, the CSP have pr produced, uh, it's called So Your Next Patient Has a Learning Disability, um, and this is aimed at physios in all various settings and environments and um, gives guidance of, of things to consider to um, accommodate someone with their learning disability. Um, so it might be that we need perhaps a longer assessment time, um, it might be they they're better not waiting and actually having their first appointment of the day, um, all sorts of things. I think carer involvement is another big, yeah. big factor, that if you've got a carer who knows a client well, if you're in a strange environment and you've got someone asking you questions and you remember the last time you came into hospital it was for an operation and you felt really sore afterwards, the last thing you want to do is to open up and tell this person how you're actually feeling. So having a carer there who knows them well and can kind of prompt, it doesn't mean that they answer all the questions, but just having someone there with them who knows them well and can support them makes a big difference. You get a truthful answer, you get a bigger, a, yeah, better subjective assessment. So they're going to feel more comfortable and more at ease, aren't they? Yeah. So they're going to get the best out of them, as yeah. you say, with their mm -hmm. answers, yeah. Mm -hmm. And often having sort of extra people attending appointments mm -hmm. to make that person more comfortable, mm -hmm. um, or in hospital having their usual carer staying with them, mm -hmm. um, so that they have someone that's familiar, knows their needs, mm -hmm. and can work with hospital staff make that a um, better experience. Mm -hmm. A lot of hospitals have um, a specific person that helps, that we communicate with, that helps to kind of filter things down to the ward. Mm -hmm. So Bournemouth and Paul Hospital both have someone, I think it's either the safeguarding liaison nurse, not necessarily, not necessarily got learning disability in their title, but just linking in with those two people where we know that someone's planning to come in mm -hmm. can make a big difference, but like Becca says, that means the carer can stay overnight, that person arranges all the funding so mm -hmm. that there'll be the right funding in place for that person to stay with them, mm -hmm. and it just, just, even if you don't have any forewarning, as soon as someone's gone in, we tend to contact them to let them know because then that, they help with the reasonable adjustments mm -hmm. um, that the ward might not normally have to make, mm -hmm. and so it can help, it's just another point mm -hmm. of, of support. And safeguarding is the right title, isn't it, because they're vulnerable and they're going into an environment mm -hmm. that makes them even more vulnerable, so that's, the, that's yeah. a good link to yeah. in the hospitals. Definitely. Yeah, and there's a couple of um, documents that are quite useful to get somebody to complete with their family or carers. Um, so there's Yellow Health Book, which is a um, bright yellow book, so it's easy, easy to find. Um, and that has lots of information about someone's health needs, their allergies, how they communicate, yeah, mobility um, levels, mobility, whether you know, what they like, dislike, what they eat and drink. Mm -hmm. um, and also a hospital care passport, which is called This Is Me, um, which somebody will have this passport that they fill in with all their needs and how they respond to various sort of medical things, the mm -hmm. um, same information about likes and dislikes and things, and that will go with the person into hospital, where at whichever ward they go on, follow them, and then come back out with them, mm -hmm. so that anyone working with them can look at this and know a bit more about the person. Okay. And that is done as a team? Is that done as a team, or how is that? So we would tend to try and get the people that work most closely mm -hmm. with the patients and fill it in. Some, some patients will fill it in themselves okay. with support, sometimes yeah. it might be family or mm -hmm. carers. Um, it, we may be involved in additions but actually it's normally the people that spend most time with mm -hmm. them that are best to complete mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. and then we can provide electronic copies of mm -hmm. it so that the hospitals have it on record, mm -hmm. but a lot of the time in the moment they're, they're focusing on the most acute mm -hmm. reason for um, mm -hmm. yeah being admitted, so we, the client has it with them, it's mm -hmm. their document, they own it, they keep it up to date, so they should bring it with them, mm -hmm. the hospital can look at it, and like Becca says, it comes home with them again mm -hmm. afterwards, so that it's got everything, yeah, allergies, medications, mm -hmm. but also communication styles, mm -hmm. how do you know if I'm in pain, how do you know if I'm happy, because it's not always obvious with some mm -hmm. of our clients, so it's all there, it's, I think it's like two or three pages, stapled together, it's A4, um, and it looks the same, so mm -hmm. Bournemouth and Paul, and I think Dorset County Hospitals, are all using the same sheet so mm -hmm. wherever someone is it should all be the same to be consistent good great are we there on reasonable adjustments 
So we just had a, a section on communication needs. Okay. Um, we've kind of mentioned throughout this that a lot of our clients, because of their learning disability, have communication support needs. Um, like Becca said, it might be that they're able to verbalise, it might be that they can do that reliably, or it might be that they'll always say yes because they want to make you happy and they can kind of pick up from the way that you're asking questions that they think they know the answer you want to give. Um, so we've got some top tips on how to communicate with someone with a learning disability. Um, it's, it's really simple and it's a kind of standard practice really. It's make, thinking about the environment that you're in and that comes under reasonable adjustments. If you can reduce the distractions, brilliant. If you can sit next to the person with eye contact, talk slowly, talk clearly. Think about the language you're using. Physios, we use loads of jargon. It just naturally comes. <laughs> So when you're talking to someone who hasn't got a clue what you're talking about, think about how you'd explain it. Have you got a model you can show it on? Could you show it on the camera? Could you demonstrate it first um, and say, can you copy me? Um, like we were talking with capacity to, um, to make a decision. It doesn't necessarily mean that someone needs to understand all the big complexities, the ins and outs of everything. Could you simplify it? Can you just say, can you do this? Can you do that one step at a time, one thing at a time? Um, yeah, is, is there something you can show them what you're talking about? Pictures, objects, kind of key points of reference um, can really help using carers to mm -hmm. help with communication. Um, thinking about non-verbal communication, can someone nod? Can they point to things? Um, can they explain things really clearly or do they need to be given a choice, like, like we were saying, between the red jumper and the blue jumper? So does it hurt? Yes or no? And the person taps their hand. It, Sometimes really small changes can make a big difference. I mean that you get much more detail in your assessments. Um, but definitely using the person that knows them well to yeah. get that information get that from. Information. So if they yeah. come with a care or a family member, ask them, how does this person normally mm. express this or that? And mm. use them rather than them sitting quietly in the corner. Yeah. Get them involved and um, use yeah. them to help you. Yeah. yeah. And like we were saying earlier about checking understanding. Mm -hmm. So rather than just keep giving them all this information, it's stopping every now and then, not just to say, have you understood? Because you'll just get a yes. <laughs> but to say, what do you understand by what I've just said? Can you tell me what this means? Can you show me what that, mm -hmm. things like that, that helps you to gauge how much they've taken on board. And it might be that actually because of their learning needs, they need to come back a week later and then you can move on to the next stage, that they need a bit of processing time between it. We've got someone that has like a whole 24 hour delay in you asking a question and he will give you the answer. Mm. So it is just, it's a lot to take on board sometimes. Mm. Um, it just takes a bit more time. Yeah, sometimes these things are a process. I think that's really helpful what you said about communication and um, I was struck by the sign-in book at your reception, which has got lots of nice pictures yeah. on it. It's a great help for me because I didn't have to put my gloves in. Yeah. So I could just sign in with the book. The <laughs> yeah. There's an indication that I needed to put the time, and I can't remember what the other picture was, but yeah. it was quite a nice. <laughs> my favourite sign-in book. So yeah. Yeah. I'd just like to finish with a few questions that the students have generated for you. Um, so all these have come from the students. So the first question is, when working with an individual with LD, how do we gain consent? We have talked about that, but this takes this a little bit further because it says, when they may not understand the assessment or the treatment or the goal. That's a really good question. So. Yeah. So hopefully we've covered most of those questions in terms of if they don't, if they lack capacity around that decision to be able to consent to assessment treatment and goal everything, um, in which case it's the best interest decision. Um, but it's interesting that you mentioned about the goals. So when you've got clients that have, let me say, capacity to make a lot of other decisions about their care, if we're saying they're not understanding the goal, is the goal really specific to them? Is it something that is the problem that they're coming to us with um, because I'd say if they were then that would be our goal so for example if someone's coming to us because they can't walk the dog anymore because their knee hurts too much as physios we're so tempted to make the goal to improve the range of movement or the strength or to be able to walk this far but actually her goal is to be able to go out and walk the dog again um, so it's making the goal specific for that client making sure that it's yeah the client is motivated towards that goal um, in terms of um, gaining consent for assessment and treatment as well, sometimes we might uh, might be overcomplicating things. So the client might not be able to understand the complicated ins and outs of all of our assessments and treatments. But 
could we simplify it? Can we give the information to them in a form they can understand? So uh, yes, I understand you're coming to me because your arm hurts. For me to be able to help you with your arm hurting, I need to be able to have a look, ask you some questions, have a look at your range of movement or the movements you do, ask you to do some movements, something along those lines. That, that is enough for them to say, okay, I understand why you need me to do this and say yes or no. Um, the same with the treatments, it just say be careful not to make presumptions that people can't understand certain things or to make presumptions that people won't comply with certain things because you'd be surprised if you just dig a little bit deeper, perhaps spend a little bit longer building up rapport, getting to know people around them, or using the carers to motivate the client, <laughs> then you, yeah, it makes a big difference. Okay, so take home message, use the carers, it's about that process, yeah. it's about taking your time, it's about establishing that rapport so that you get some trust mm -hmm. and then that's half your yeah. that's And part. there will still be clients that can't mm -hmm. consent, can't understand and that's where the best mm -hmm. interest is yeah. shown. Great, that's really helpful, thank you. So the next question I think is a really interesting question. Um, does, someone with LD, does someone with LD age improve growing up, sorry I haven't read that very well, but you know what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah. For example, if they were 17 and the LD age of 7, would this increase when they are 25? So it's about how that LD change, age changes as a person changes yeah. in terms of their biological no, that's, age. That's a good question. It, I've also heard that referred to as being like the mental age mm -hmm. of XYZ. Um, often mental age is linked with IQ, um, so there's some sources that will describe a moderate, mild or severe LD based on, or this means they've got an LD range of X, Y, Z. Um, we don't often refer to it in our service, but the two are linked. So like I mentioned before, learning disability being something that's permanent, that's not going to change. Um, and then, yeah, generally speaking, the age wouldn't change. However, um, in children's services and adolescents, that is slightly different in that there, there can be improvements and changes. But in adult services, often once you've reached a certain level, that's where things, um, things stop. There will be other factors that affect that. So same as IQ, that um, when we're coming to assess someone's IQ or yeah, mental age, then it's mental health, if you've got some stress or some bereavement going on, or you're particularly unwell at that moment, you'll get a false reading. So that's where it's important to understand the context of the assessment and the context of where that person is now. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said before, our main focus is on the social functioning and trying to promote independence, improve independent living skills or quality of life for those individual clients. Mm -hmm. So regardless of what their mental age or LD age might be, yes, it's unlikely to change, but the social functioning things, the side of things might change or there might be other adapt adaptations or support needs that we can meet to be able to improve the function. And health needs well, might change. Absolutely. Too. Yeah. As, as we grow older, all our health needs change, don't they? So that's yeah, another. Yeah, the yeah. same for our minds. Definitely. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, um, this is another interesting question. I've heard of some LD schools using a personal storybook to help prepare the individual for an activity that may be coming up in the future, so that they are aware of what they may be asked or are required to do, to make them feel more confident or aware. For example, having a vaccination. Is this a method the community teams use with the individual and their carer? Yes, and, um, it's something we use quite a lot for various reasons. Um, so we refer to them as social stories. Um, and we sometimes work with our speech and language therapy colleagues to know how best that person will respond, so whether it's pictures, simple words with pictures, um, how much it needs to be broken down. Um, but we use them for sometimes, perhaps before a physio assessment, to prepare somebody. So I've sent one ahead before when I've heard that the person likes to be prepared for what's going to happen. So it might have my photo, it might have a picture of them with it, or somebody with a sad face, thumbs down, and um, perhaps a, perhaps they've got elbow pain or something, cross by it. So it's sort of they can understand it's about that, and then pictures to sort of explain what I would be expecting the assessment to, um, process to happen, how what I'll be doing, what I'll ask them to do, um, and with the goal of trying to make it better. Um, so we'll use it for that sort of situation. Sometimes we'll use it to prepare someone for a big change, so they're going to go through an operation, mm -hmm. what happens before, during and after. Um, also for a big change in their life, so perhaps um, they're moving house or they're going for a bereavement and not understanding quite what's 
happening or to help them understand um, a health decision they're making um, or motivate them to do something new, like a new activity, mm. healthy eating, um, some new exercises. So we use them for all sorts of things. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for those lovely examples. Okay, so the fourth question um, is some people with LD have difficulty re retaining information. So what's the best way to get someone with LD to engage and also to be able to repeat an activity, treatment and exercise when we aren't present? I and mean, then a really good question um, from, from our students. So thank you for the question. <laughs> so... Yeah, so um, I guess initially you want to sort of try and get to know the individual and understand their needs and what you're aiming to achieve. Is it something that they understand and they are aiming to achieve as well? So like you've already given the example of the leg problem, but actually the person just wants to better walk their dog. Um, so it's trying to tailor it to that, using the right communication to, for you to understand what they want and then to understand what you're expecting. Um, in terms of compliance and um, looking at perhaps using um, staff or family members to support them, perhaps to prompt them with their exercises or whatever it is we put in place. Um, you might use a recording chart so that you can tick off yeah. that they've done them, sometimes reward charts as well. <laughs> Stickers are usually <laughs> quite popular. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Perhaps they could attend some sort of group or they could do their activity in a functional way. So rather than sitting and doing my exercises, they're doing something fun that they enjoy, but it actually, sneakily, they're doing an exercise within that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's also finding out what, what works for them, what motivates them, tailoring it to things they like, as we talked about, um, being a bit creative. So I've done exercise programmes involving Peppa Pig and cats and... Um, favourite bands, so um, it's just being a bit creative. Mm -hmm. If they're enjoying it, they might not even particularly realise they're doing the physio, yeah. um, but compliance is likely to be better. Mm -hmm. I sat with someone on a gym ball once with a Nerf gun and cardboard <laughs> aliens around the room and he had to twist to <laughs> keep his balance and twist to shoot the aliens. That was the bizarre set of notes I've ever had to write up, but it worked, it was brilliant and the compliance was fantastic because he used to love playing it and try to beat his high score with how many you could hit. But man's fun. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to go and buy my striped blue t shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds great fun. Yeah, I'm very much motivated by reward when it comes to exercise and I'm also mm. motivated by disguising the exercise. Yes, yeah, yeah. So exactly. I very much relate to that. Yeah. Okay, um, and then I guess we're just wondering what an average working day is in the LD team. That's going to be a really, that's a really <laughs> hard question because there's probably no such thing as an average day, but can you just give us a bit of a snapshot about what your days are like? It is a good question. I, I would generally say that no two days are really the same. Um, just because we're constantly thinking outside the box, we're meeting new people, which brings new challenges. Um, yeah, needing to think outside the box and be creative. Um, but having said that, there, there are, we, we do draw on each other for support and once we've been creative in one area, well, we've got the resources then, so let's just see if this approach will work with someone else. Um, and definitely, like we said before, we often go to these appointments with our physio plan in mind, we know what we want to do and then it's just trying to find a way of making it work for the right client. Um, but yeah, in terms of like kind of generally what, what's our workload like. Um, we've got about 25 to 30 clients on average on our caseload. Um, we aim to see two or three clients every day, which really doesn't sound very a lot, especially compared to our busy MSK services. I know, I'm aware of that. Um, but it allows us to give the client the time that they need. Um, so when we go to wheelchair services, it might take two, two and a half hours mm -hmm. just to get their seating right. Um, when we're trying to build up rapport with someone, we might go out and spend an hour with them and actually not done much pure physio assessment, but you're building up rapport. They're tolerating you being in their mm -hmm. personal space and that will then have benefits mm -hmm. later on. So the fact that we only see two or three people every day gives us the time that we need to do the job properly. Mm -hmm. And there's also, it gives us 
time to liaise with other services, to link in with care provider, the home, the day centre, to find out whether those problems exist just in that one place or whether they are across the board and we need to get everyone on the same page and working together. So it gives us more time for kind of the admin side of things, liaising with people and bringing people together as well. Mm, I guess examples of places we might see patients, we would see them at home, at day centres, Sometimes at a leisure centre, we might take someone swimming or do hydrotherapy with them. Yeah. We might go along to an outpatient appointment with them, or if one of our patients has gone into hospital, we might go and work with ward therapists um, to help. Um, so lots of different places that we'll see people. So very varied days. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the best way for you to find out what our team is like and what the average day is like is to come and join us. So hopefully some students will be able to come on placement, but if not, then yeah, find our contact details, we'll, we'll give it, put them online and yeah, just give us a call and we'll arrange for you to come and yeah. spend a day with us and see what it's like. That's great. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're certainly that's very good and several of them will come on placement, <laughs> so that's, yeah. that, that's great. Um, and I guess some of it is um, note writing, so you do electronic mm -hmm. notes on the re yeah, yeah. So again, that's quite time consuming, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. And your notes are going to be quite complex because yeah. um, it's so broad mm -hmm. and there's so many factors to consider and so many discussions to, yeah. to consider. And trying to word exactly how you sound mm -hmm. that person on the gym ball, which you do for a couple of days. Yeah. But yeah, do <laughs> clinical reasoning. <laughs> and, yeah. 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 Great. Okay. So our final question um, this afternoon is related to a case that the students are looking at at the moment. And um, I think that your input is probably going to be a lot better than mine. So while I've got you here, it'd be good just to see what you think about this case. Um, as a young girl, 21-year-old girl who's had Down syndrome, she's mm. also got epilepsy. She's recently been in hospital following a seizure. Um, got complications with an aspiration pneumonia. She's gone home, not really doing very much at home, enjoying sort of sitting on the sofa, listening to her music, watching um, her favourite film, Frozen. GP really and the family really want to keep this young lass at home, don't want to get her back into hospital. So um, the scenario is, is that, the, that the physio you know, is involved to try and prevent another admission to hospital. I wonder if you've got any pearls of wisdom to help the students work that one out. <laughs> so looking at um, the case study, I think one of the things that jumps out to me is actually there's, there's people around Ellie that she works well with and it's really useful to tap into that. So whether it's working with the family or the staff that work well with her um, to try and help motivate her and encourage and prompt with things. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, yeah, I was going to say the second point is just, yeah. Um, yeah, look specifically at what motivates Ellie. So there's a couple of clues in the case scenario about what she might be interested in. Have a think about what your physio plan might be, what you want to achieve, and then try to link that in with what you know motivates her, what you know she enjoys and what she likes anyway. Try and mix the two together. Particularly with music, that's always helpful yeah. for getting someone moving. Yeah. And Respiratory-wise, yeah, anything that helps to expand yeah. yeah. you're on to a winner. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. okay.